first off, I'm not going to bore you all with a bunch of dry facts and figures and stuff like that because I'm sure you already know. What I'm here today to tell you about is what actually goes on inside one of those places. But before I do, I need to tell you a little bit about my background because it's pretty typical. Most Tyson employees and other poultry industry employees' backgrounds are like. I was born in a small rural community and grew up in a small rural community in the southern Ozarks in northwestern Arkansas. Grew up on a farm. <clears throat> we had cows and pigs and chickens and stuff like that. So I was no stranger to killing animals for food and I did it for years. Um, I started catching chickens when I was 14 years old. I caught chickens all the way through my high school years. Uh, after that, I joined the military for a while. Then I came home and I went to work at Tyson Plant in 1990. I worked at the Clarksville Plant, uh, the Waldron Plant, the Broken Bow Plant, and the last five years at the Granny's Plant as killer. So uh, I think I know what I'm talking about. Um, a few of the things I want to touch on primarily are um, <clears throat> the people, the people that work in those places and the people that run those places. The people that work on the, work in those places are just, you know, your basic hillbilly. I mean, um, most of them, <clears throat> most of them are very uneducated. Um, some of them can't even read a comic book without some help. Um, Tyson actually employs somebody to assist with uh, job applications because most of the people can't fill them out. They also have a lot of Hispanic people that can't speak English, so naturally they can't write it. Um, so, you know, I mean, you've got a bunch of people here that, that really couldn't possibly hope to get a really good job, so they're stuck working for Tyson, and Tyson knows it. They pick on rural communities for that reason. And so do most of the other poultry producing industries. So you have a lot of people that get really frustrated. Nobody really likes their job. Uh, nobody I knew liked their job. I didn't like my job. But it was about all I had. So you have uh, these people that get really, they get really, really frustrated. And you have those that are kind of sadistic. You know, some of them are very sadistic. Um, you have. A lot of people who are convicted felons, I'd say probably 80 to 85 percent of the people I work with have been convicted of violent crimes at one time or another in their lives. People that shouldn't even be allowed to handle animals at all, period. Um, I saw, I, there's no way I could list all the cruel and inhumane things that I saw while I worked there. I mean, everything from standard industry practice, which is cruel and terrible in itself, to um, more sadistic types of cruelty like dry ice bombs. I don't know how many of you read my statement that I made to Pia. Um, Bruce definitely has. Uh, this guy just, he built dry ice bombs and blew chickens up. I saw people rip the heads from them, throw them in the floor and stomp on them, rip them in half, pull their heads off and put them on the end of their finger and go around like this, you know, like a puppet. I and mean, it was, it, it not only was it common, it happened every single night. Every single night that I worked there for years and years, and in more than one plant. The industry says that this sort of thing is isolated when they get caught. No, the only thing it's isolated to is the industry itself. Um, they also had what they call, and you'll have to excuse my language, they had shit fights. They would actually take a chicken and squeeze it until the shit squirted out of it on the guy next to him. My first night on the line as a hanger, I turned around and looked at the guy next to me and he squirted right in my face and then laughed about it. And it's not only is it common, it happens all the time. And like I said, you know, these people are extremely violent. Like Mr. Mason was talking about earlier, uh, taciturn, macho, that sort of thing. Well, you know, I saw even more than that. It wasn't uncommon for these people to get into fights. We saw fights on back dock on a regular basis. Um, a few of the other things, one of the other things I want to talk about is the industry purports a lot of myths 
a lot of myths about things. Like they say that the stunner was designed as a humane method of rendering a chicken insensitive to pain. That, that's a bald faced lie. And that's not what they told us. That's not what they told us. The only reason they instituted the stunner was so that they could institute a killing machine to kill faster. So that the human killer who is actually, you know, there's absolutely no way that you can kill 186 birds a minute. But a machine can kill enough of them supposedly to where the human killer can finish it. That never happens. Never happens. Not one single night that I worked for Tyson did I ever, ever see a human killer manage to kill all those chickens without missing some, if not all of them. A friend of mine was in there one night. We had 92,000 92, chickens to run in eight hours. Well, here we was. We started out uh, probably a half hour into the shift. The machine broke down. The killing machine broke down. Well, instead of stopping the plant, doing the maintenance, putting the machine back online, they sent two guys in there to drag the machine out, and the guy standing there with the knife, Aaron Harris, had to kill for the rest of the night without the benefit of the machine which is try to kill 186 chickens a minute without missing any. Now, I don't know about any of you, but there's no way I could do that. Nobody that I know of could do that. Um, line speed, that's something else I wanna talk about. They say 186 a minute, 182 a minute, 184 a minute, you know, different plants have different supposed speeds. This is a minute, you know, this, it's a ball-faced lie. You could take a stopwatch, which is how they figure out how fast the line's moving, by the way. They, they stand there with a stopwatch and they time it. I'm sure um, that guy there could tell you. Um, well, if you time that line three times in a row on back dock, you'd get, you, you would get three different answers. Because the simple fact of the matter is the machines push the line at a constant rate, at a constant amount of force. And um, the weight of the chickens, if the line is full, slows the line down. If the line is not full, it speeds up. And then front line has to make up the difference. Front line being an evisceration line. Um, and then you have things that the supervisors order you to do that's a little bit out of the actual regular curriculum, but considered standard practice on back dock that they don't ever talk about. Like if you've got several new hires on the line, you're gonna have a lot of what's called one legger even actually experienced hangers hang one layer sometimes. That's a chicken that's hung by one leg when it should be hung by two. Well, the chicken doesn't make it through the machine right, so it doesn't get processed right, it gets ripped up. So what they tell you is, don't let it go past you if you're hanging on the end. You get it off the line any way you can. If that means ripping that chicken in half, if that means ripping its leg off, if that means ripping its foot off, you do it. If you don't do it, you're fired, flat out. I mean, there's, there's no choice. And they'll tell you straight up, you are the most expendable human beings on earth. We can fire you anytime we want, and there's 10 people standing in line down at the unemployment office to take your place. And if they don't do it, we'll go get us a busload of illegals, and we'll put them in there. And then they'll do it. And uh, then you've got bad maintenance. The thing is, the poultry industry realizes that most of their people are not going to stay there that long. They're, you know, nobody's going to nobody's going to stay in that plant that long, even maintenance personnel, because they get paid so little. So you have a lot of people coming and going and coming and going, and so they don't waste a lot of time training people. They have what they call a training program. I at Grannis for the last two and a half years that I worked there was considered a trainer. The trainer's job wasn't to teach the new hire how to work, how to do the job, wasn't to teach him how to do it more humanely. It was to catch what he missed until he managed to either get it right or they fired him, one or the other. Um, so you get workers with lots and lots of bad attitudes. And you really can't blame them for having a bad attitude. They take it out on the chickens. They do it for one reason. Um, those that, you know, they get frustrated. They see those chickens as property of Tyson. And that's the only way that they can get back at Tyson, is to take those chickens and destroy them. They never stop to think that the growers are the ones that actually pay for that because the chickens aren't considered Tyson property until after they're plucked and feathered. The, the counter is in the feather room. Um, um, Paul's video, I believe it was titled 45 Days in the Life of a Chicken, in the Life of a Broiler Chicken. Some of that footage was taped 
at the Greenwich plant where I work. Uh, Paul, would you please operate the VCR? I want to show you a little something. For those of you who have never seen anything like this, um, this is what it actually looked like inside where I was working at. Show you a few things. These are catchers. They're 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 catchers. they the chickens are transported to the slaughter plant. They are denied food, water, and shelter from extreme temperatures. Some chickens don't survive the trip. Sometimes those trucks will sit on the yard for three and four hours in the blazing sun in the summertime. A fearful, stressful, injurious, and even fatal procedure. At the slaughter plant, the chickens are moved out of the trucks, dumped onto conveyors, and hung upside down in shackles. These are hangers. A machine cuts their This is the killing machine. This is the one I work behind. See this guy right here? Laws regulating their welfare during slaughter. See how all of them are flapping? Those whose throats aren't slit. That's a skull. One scalding tanks. Once dead, the chicken carcasses are feathered, dismembered, and disemboweled. Each step in the process makes the chicken's bodies less recognizable until it's hard for us to remember that if you can imagine seeing this night after night after night, after night it gets pretty bad after a while it will desensitize a person it desensitized me it made me cruel and mean i'm an ex-convict myself i was in prison for a violent crime and um you know one day i met laura and she kind of changed all that she made me a better person, or helped me to make myself a better person. And uh, I don't believe I'm the only one that could come out of that place that way. I believe there are others. Uh, let me tell you a little, a little story. One of the guys that I worked with down there, after I had um, made my statement to PETA and went to the police, by the way, when I went to the police, instead of actually taking my statement and trying to do something about it, they arrested me for a bogus crime and lock me up. You see, most of the sheriff's department in Polk County own chicken houses, Tyson chicken houses. And uh, they're not going to take a chance of ruining their own livelihood. So, well, that kind of speaks for itself, I think. Um, anyhow, Aaron was at first, at, you know, extremely mad at me because I got in trouble. And uh, chances are, he probably won't ever become a vegetarian, although he might. But when I started telling him about a lot of the changes that the animal rights community wanted to make, he was interested. Not because it would help the chickens, which is, you know, our, our reason for wanting to do it, but because it would help the workers. And I believe that he's not the only one that would feel that way. I believe if these people actually knew that the changes we're asking for would help them, I believe they'd go for it, like gas killing. That's one of the things that, you know, I mean, I realize that our eventual aim is to stop all murder of animals. I realize that. But as Bruce pointed out earlier, that's going to come one step at a time. It's not going to happen just like that. And this is one step in the right direction. And I believe that if we carried this message to the people that work on back dock in chicken plants around this country, that some of them would listen. I really believe that they would, because it would help them. There's a few other things I wanted to touch on, a couple of other things I wanted to touch on, like, um, um, I'm sorry, I forget your name. Um, yes, sir. Lester, I, I'm, I'm so bad with names, I'm sorry. Anyhow, he pointed out um, something about HACCP a little earlier, you know, H-A-C-C-P. Um, one of the reasons that that doesn't work is because those QA or QC people, depending on the plant that you're in, are directly 
directly answer to a Tyson supervisor. They're a Tyson employee. Not only that, they've got one of the easier jobs in the plant. It, it pays better and the work is not as hard. So they want to keep it. Well, the supervisor, who's, um, by the way, gets bonuses for running overproduction or um, running super efficient, which to them, running efficient means getting the birds run through there as quickly as possible. And they do, they refer to them as birds. They also refer to them to the other people who work there as post-process product and uh, pre-process product, depending on what stage of the killing process they're in. Um, well, these people have to answer to these supervisors, and these supervisors will tell them straight up, this plant has to run. These chickens have to be run. Uh, you can either do it, or we'll find somebody else that will. And you can go back on the line and bust your hump. And so naturally, what are they going to do? They're, they're going to take the easy way out, which is human nature for a lot of people. And um, Jim back there, he was talking earlier about uniform size. And yes, that is a definite point. They try to make the animals as uniform in size as possible so that it's, it presents a more um, efficient operation. They can run faster. Well, unfortunately, nature has its own way of doing things. And although they try like hell to make those chickens as uniform as possible, it does not work out that way. So um, you end up, what they do is, they set the machine for the big ones, you kill the little ones by hand. The little ones are the hardest ones to see. So guess what? The little ones get scalded alive. And um, a lot of times you'll set up for a certain size of, of chicken and the chickens that come in, they're supposed to be, okay, the, the field man will go out to the house and he'll say these chickens weigh on average four and a half pounds. So we're going to set the machinery for four and a half pounds. Well, no, they'll come in, they'll weigh six, six, you know, five, five and a half, six pounds. The reason for that is anything over a five pound chicken, catch crickets paid a bonus for, for catching what they consider oversized chickens. So these field men are trying to keep the, the actual size down. What they'll do is they'll go in the house and they'll randomly select the smallest birds they can find and weigh them. And so that's how they come up with their size. And so for that reason, the plant sets up for much smaller chickens than they're actually supposed to run. Then instead of stopping the line and uh, actually adjusting the machinery the way it should be, or stopping the line and spreading out the shackles so that you don't have to break the chicken's legs, which is another thing that happens. You're standing here, you're hanging chickens, and all of a sudden, you come to the next lot. Well, the way they change lots is the last truck of this lot, which is one grower's chickens, goes out and the next lot comes in. And there could be as much as two and a half, three pound size difference in these chickens. Could be even more than that. Well, instead of readjusting for that size chicken, you go ahead and run it with the machinery set up the way it is. It's pretty simple to spread those shackles out. All you gotta take is a 10 pound hammer and a steel bar and drive it down through them and it spreads them out so that they accommodate the larger size chickens. Well, instead of doing that, They'll tell you, put them in there. Slam them in there as best you can. What it comes down to is you picking up chickens like this and slamming them as hard as you can down in the shackles. It shatters their legs. Excuse me. Good dinner. It um, dislocates their, their uh, thighs. It dislocates their knees, or hocks as they call them, and just generally causes a lot of pain. So, um, any questions? Can you tell the story about breaking the legs of chickens deliberately? Yes, sir. Can you tell that story? Uh, there's two ways that that can happen. Now, I saw, I'm not sure which account you're talking about. Okay. Uh, if, you could, if you could refresh my memory because... No, you said you got some broiler chickens in. They were spin large. Huh? They were spin hens that were supposed to be run at a plant in Center, Texas and the plant broke down and they were being caught in my area. And so um, instead of taking them down to Center Texas and having them wait, they brought them to our plant, which was not in any way equipped to deal with 
bur with chickens of that size. And so that was what I was talking about, oversized chickens, what they consider to be oversized chickens. You pick these things up, you raise them over your head, and you slam them as hard as you can in, into the shackles and hope that they go down. And, uh, you know, it shatters their legs, it dislocates their knees, it dislocates their hips. Sometimes it will actually break their necks. They hit the bottom of the shackle so hard. Yeah. So, so in other words, you weren't deliberately breaking the legs, but you were slamming the chickens into the shackles so hard that that was one of the things that happened. Yes, sir. Uh, USDA inspectors at my plant didn't concern themselves with humane handling. All they concerned themselves with was, well, other than covering their own backsides, um, the inside operations, what they call the inside operations, on evisceration and farther on. When they were supposed to make their rounds to the killing room or back dock, you'd find them standing outside smoking. No, sir, they, they would not. They would have no, no jurisdiction whatsoever. That brings up something, that I, something else that I should have said. Um, you know, we talk about getting chickens covered under the Humane Slaughter Act, and that is a good thing. They need to be covered under the Humane Slaughter Act. But without strict supervision inside each and every one of these plants, um, it, it's, it's not going to matter because the people that hang these chickens, that handle these chickens, um, they're used to breaking laws anyway. Like I said, most of them are convicted felons. Some of them have been convicted of multiple felonies. They're used to breaking laws. They're going to do it again because, because they're being told to, because they enjoy it. Whatever reason, they're going to do it. They have to be monitored on a regular basis. There needs to be some sort of screening. Um, yeah, Virgil, you said that you that uh, you agree that uh, chickens should be covered under, and presumably all poultry should be covered under the Humane Slaughter Act, which presently they are totally excluded from. That's could, right. Could you, given what you just said about the need for monitoring, et cetera, what do you see as the advantage of uh, including uh, chickens and turkeys and ducks under the Humane Slaughter Act? Well, it would give a prosecutor something to prosecute for. Right now, um, there's. There's absolutely um, no laws that they can prosecute under that I know of that they are willing to prosecute under. So it would give them something to prosecute under. Then the animal rights community could put enough pressure on them to maybe get them to prosecute. But as long as um, um, it's just the workers that are being prosecuted, this is not going to work either. You can't just prosecute the workers because the workers are expendable. Tyson will scapegoat. When um, PETA investigated that Pilgrim's Pride plant in Virginia, you see what happened. They fired the line workers. The plant manager's still there. He hasn't went anywhere, and that's where it all came from. They're going to have to go to the top. You're going to have to start from the top down. These workers are expendable. They'll replace them just that quick. You, they fire one right now, they would have another one hired by dinner time. Absolutely. At the very least, at the very, very least, uh, have to turn up the ambition, but probably they have to do quite a bit more than that if, if birds ended up covered under the Humane Slaughter Act. So there would still be sadistic abuse because probably it wouldn't be enforced, but some of the some of the current abuses would have to be phased out because they're abuses by design. Absolutely. Um, I don't believe that the Humane Slaughter Act, I don't believe they should be allowed to use an uh, uh, stunner bath anyway. I do not believe they should be allowed to do that. There's no way that you can make that humane. Well, actually, um, killing in itself is inhumane. But it would be closer to humane to use gas killing. I don't believe that you could ever 
um, truly make a stunner to where it was that humane. I really don't. Well, yeah, I, I was going to ask that, that question. I mean, from what all from all the reading I've done on the use of elect the electrified water bath stun cabinet. I mean, first of all, they're giving very weak shocks as far as milliampers are concerned because That's right. they don't want the capillaries and the other vessels to break and cause what they call a bloody bird. The bird, you know, it also shatters their bones like a clavicle. So if you turn it up real high, uh, then you're going to have a, an unmarketable bird with That's hemorrhaging right. in the wings and the parts of the breast and so on. And if you read the if you read the uh, the development of electrical stunning in the 1930s, um, there was n there, it had nothing to do with rendering birds unconscious. It just had re it had to do with facilitating feather release by uh, paralyzing the uh, muscles of the feather follicles, so the feather fo feathers would come out more easily, and to hold them still as opposed to what they would do on farms, like they'd take a, a stick or something and and stick it up through the roof of their mouth, through that groove in the top of their mouth, and stick it and scramble their brain. Or put them in a blood, uh, what do you call it, a killing cone, which they still do. And Mary's going to talk about this somewhat tomorrow. These so-called alternative humane farms, which are not humane, where they imagine having your throat cut and you're in this killing cone and you can't move, right? You just you can't flail or anything. So they use electricity to just hold them still on the line, as well as to facilitate feather release and to cause certain meat characteristics that they want. But there's no way. I mean, I don't want to. When you read all these poultry scientists talking about how, uh, at the very minimum, to ensure that at least 90% uh, of the chickens never wake up again during the slaughter process, uh, you have to use 120 milliampers. Well, talk to Wayne Kensel at the University of Maryland or, or uh, Simon uh, Simmons uh, Electrical Company that supplies a lot of this stuff, and they'll say they use 15 to 20 or 12, 12 to 15 milliampers per bird which is just a torturous electric shock. And when you read, think about all the information that's come out about, about the torture of a single individual who's being electrocuted to die, and they have a horrible death, and in the use of the electrified water bath stun cabinet, there isn't even the intention of killing the birds, because the whole purpose is to keep them alive through the slaughter process, right? Absolutely. And keep their hearts beating. The so they're not even intended to be uh, killed and yet human beings who are killed one at a time under the death penalty the, the, the description of what they go through is horrific so what you said is just can't be blared loudly enough it couldn't possibly be made into anything but pure torture yes ma'am I have seen granish used down to 10 down to 10 I've seen their turners down to 10 and if they have a person that they want rid of, but they want them to quit so that they don't have to pay unemployment or at least don't have to pay it as soon, they will do things to force that person to quit, like put them in the killing room, turn the stunner down, uh, open up the bars on the killing machine so that it doesn't cut all the way. You have what you call miscuts. Now these are chickens whose throats have been cut on the surface. The feathers have been pulled out, the throat's been mauled. Sometimes it'll cut down on the beak, down here at the other points of their jaw. And what that causes them to do is flop and flap and go crazy. And the whole point is to get to sling blood in this guy's eyes, sling it on his, on his body, on his face, beat him up. I've actually had bruises on my arms from this. They pulled this stunt on me repeatedly when they decided for me to quit. Um, it took them about eight months and they finally decided instead of forcing me to quit, they would just fire me. They done everything under the sun to get rid of me simply because I would not keep my mouth shut. But um, that's some of the things that they do. And yes, uh, the stunner is not meant to be humane. Not meant at all. And you also, something you didn't say, uh, they put salt in these. It, they have to have salt in them to make them work right. And the salt tube has to be refilled periodically. Well, you've got this guy on the floor called a floor man or a utility or we called him a few other things. Um, his job was, one of his jobs was to fill the stunner with salt. You should fill the stunner with salt at every break. Uh, we were lucky if we could get him to fill it once a night. Without the salt, the electrical, the amount of electricity that they, that actually hits the chickens is, I'm not sure exactly what the actual figure is, but it's much, much less. I've seen chickens come through the stunner, jump out of the shackles and run around on the floor. And what they told us to do, when you have a chicken out running around the floor, stomp him to death. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to cut his throat. Stomp him to death. Kill him. Because otherwise, he may get 
out into the feather room and then go from there down on the uh, evisceration line and then the USDA would condemn a large portion of the chicken that was on the line at that time, which could run into um, hundreds if not thousands of pounds. Paul. Can you talk about times when uh, the stunner was turned up too high? Uh, when the stunner is cranked up way over what it should be, it'll actually blow their eyes out. It'll burn what's left of their combs off. It'll burn their wingtips. It'll burn their feet. It leaves blisters on them. I have seen, you, I have stood there, you stand there in front of a killing machine like this. You grab the chickens, you cut their throat like that. Well, you can see down towards the center this way. And you look down there and you see, and when you see these chickens with their eyeballs going psh, psh, and popping against the side of the stern, you know somebody cranked it up as a joke. That's done as a joke. That's considered fun, enjoyment. until I made my statement and haven't worked for Tyson since, I saw three women work on back dock. One of them lasted more than a night. Mostly, it seems like they don't choose to work back there. Mostly, they choose to work in cold pack or debone or some other place. But um, I, I guess you're asking... Um, but that's what I mean. What about the relationship? Uh, well, if a supervisor decides he wants one of them, they can either put out or leave. Is that what you're asking? Other than that, there's a lot of cheating goes on. Well, no, I just, I just want to know in terms of so far the, the video footage that we've seen when we talk about people convicted of violent crimes, you know, it seems like what we're talking about here in terms of the sadistic abuses that are being perpetrated by men. I don't Mostly know so, yes. Yeah. I've never seen a woman sadistically abuse a live chicken on back dock. No. And, 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 and I've also heard about, about um, uh, various injuries and, and, and things suffered by, by women working in these poultry plants. But I see the difference. What you're saying is that women are working in a completely different area of the plant than the men you're talking about. Yes, sir. Very little. Uh, back dock people at the plants that I worked at were actually discouraged from having anything to do with people in other parts of the plant. We were pretty much kept separate as much as possible. It wasn't a definite rule, but they tried to keep it that way because of what they call cross-contamination. We would get fecal matter shit on the people that worked in D-Bone, and if USDA caught it, they would condemn chickens. If you caused USDA to condemn chickens, you were fired. So would you say that mainly men worked with the birds while they were still alive? Yes, ma'am, almost exclusively. Um, that's a good question. One for Karen, why, uh, I didn't understand the part about why it's hard to keep eating before they're dead. And then also, can you talk about like um, some of the most common injuries or you know, or health threats for the actual workers on the killing? Oh, you're asking for something here. Um, the reason they want to keep they want the heart to keep beating is because twice as long to bleed a chicken out if its heart's not beating. The whole point is to get the chicken to bleed as fast as possible so that the line can run as fast as possible. Injuries, injuries um, and illnesses are so numerous that it'd be hard for me to describe them all. I have arthritis in my hip, my knee, my wrist, my knuckles, my elbows, and my shoulders. And that's not at all uncommon. I've seen a lot of carpal tunnel, I've seen a lot of tendonitis. They use you up and throw you away. You're like an old boot. As soon as you become no longer useful, they get rid of you. If you go to the doctor and you complain too much, 
They're going to drug test you, knowing that you're going to fail. Because if you manage to work there any time at all, you're going to do it by doing drugs. Absolutely. That's the only way you can keep up, night after night after night. When you say road test, do you mean test you for drugs? What does that mean um, They take you in and do a urine analysis. And they use that selectively. Uh, as long as you're not causing uh, them to spend any money or they don't want rid of you, they know you're doing dope, so they're not going to mess with you. They know all, almost all backdoc people, I wouldn't say all, but nearly all, probably 90%, do some, some form of speed, whether it be legal or illegal. I used both. Um, but they use it as a tool to get rid of those in the plant that they don't want. Or um, in the case of somebody that's injured, that's going to need a lot of doctor's care and maybe workman's comp, they'll do it to get rid of somebody so that they don't have to pay that. Well, this person was using drugs on the job, therefore we don't have to pay. But it's urine analysis is what they use. Is, does that answer your question? mostly line workers. There are people who would be interested probably, well I've, I've talked to a couple of people who would have been interested in coming forward and probably still would because it makes their job, it would make their job easier. I understand that maybe that's a little bit uh, borderline for a lot of AR people because actually our aim is to stop all animal murders whatsoever. But if you could get somebody like me Coming out of every chicken plant in this country, I believe that it would facilitate that. Virgil, I, I, I wonder if you would speak to, I, I think what you just said is exactly right. If you could get somebody like you coming out of those plants. But my experience living up in, um, up in Maryland, where, where the industry is very, is very strong, is that people, even people who don't work there, are afraid of me. I've had people who won't have a conversation with me in my backyard about Purdue, because that's the power where I live, because their cousin works at the factory, and they're scared that if they, in a private conversation, say something bad about Frank Purdue, their cousin will lose his job. And so, given that, is the, do you also agree that's the level of fear? And if so, what's the likelihood that even if they're with you, they would express it, they would feel comfortable expressing it? It would be a group, like a, um, um, maybe you could go to a union or something. Or there's a few people that work there, you know, from time to time that would actually open up and comprehend something like this. The whole point is it would make their jobs easier. And that's what I saw. I, I know from my own experience from talking to Aaron Harris, who was mad enough at me when I first walked in his house after I had made that PETA statement, to actually want to physically attack me. He went from that to uh, backing me and being willing to help. He was willing to come forward, but only under uh, if he had been subpoenaed in a court case. So, you know, I mean, it's a toss up, but I think it's worth a try. Okay, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, let's say you get uh, workers coming out, uh, such as yourself, and uh, describing the conditions and urging better conditions. Well then, how, where, where, do, where do these changes come? I mean, how, how, as you say, these work, workers are considered so expendable that what leverage does exist? Uh, how do, who, would who would make the changes? The, uh, Tyson, uh, are we talking about, who makes, and what, how, how does the change come about? What, what is, the, what is the, 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 the key or the leverage or whatever it is that gets uh, any attention to the plight of the workers to want to actually implement and to implement the changes that you're describing, the better working conditions. How would that work? The workers themselves that came forward would probably either be terminated or quit. But if you got it out to the average public, the average public doesn't know what goes on in those places. 
I know because I've talked to enough of them. I believe that public opinion would probably start to turn. Maybe at a faster rate than it is now. Actually, well, I, I got to go a long ways back for that. You see, when I first met Laura, I didn't know that groups like this even existed. I didn't know about PETA. I didn't know about UPC. I didn't know about the ALF. All I knew about was the Humane Society and the SPCA, and I thought all they did was take in dogs and cats. So, you know, I knew what was going on was wrong, but I had no idea how to go about trying to fix it. I tried to fix it myself without any help at all. So it actually it was gradual and it wasn't. I mean, I realized what I was doing was wrong. I justified that by saying I need a job. You know, I, I need to be able to support myself. I need to be able to support my family. At the time, I had a son. I still do have a son. At the time, I had a son living at home and a wife that depended on me to bring in a living. And I knew if I didn't work for Tyson, I wouldn't bring in a steady living. So, you know, that's pretty much it. But um, after Laura and I met, we started talking about it. She took me to work one night, and she wanted to see. She wanted to see for herself exactly what it was that I did. So I took her in there, and you know, I realized for the first time in my life, I was actually so embarrassed for my wife, girlfriend, whatever you want to call her, to uh, see what I did for a living. I actually realized that I was embarrassed of that. And at that point, I decided, no more, no more. I'm not going to do something that I'm so embarrassed about that my own partner would be ashamed to see me do it. Virgil, I'm so glad that you brought this up because I think, I think there's a lot of people that are involved in the industry who have that kind of a, I know it's wrong, but I'm doing it for this reason or that reason. And I'm interested to know what are your thoughts about what kinds of things could be done to sort of push people towards that kind of crisis that you have. Um, do, you, do you understand what I'm asking? Yes, I understand. Where it becomes unbearable to live with that internal conflict. It would take confronting them by somebody that they cared about. Somebody that it mattered to them what that person thought. That I believe that's what it would take. And once, like it did me. I mean, I, I was... I cared a lot about what Laura thought about me. And I could tell that it hurt her. I could tell that because I watched her cry myself. I stood there and watched the tears run down her face. You stood them and say, you know, put this on your top three. How did you go to those Did you go to those people as an animal rights activist or as Thank a person? Pardon? Thank you, Doss. Because of uh, the work that we've been doing, you know, with you and with uh, Pilgrim's mm -hmm. Pride. I guess I have a question of both Bruce and Virgil, and that is, when we talk, first of all, one clarification for everybody, when we talk about gas study, we're not talking about just administering CO2, which is an extremely inhumane death, which causes suffocation and very difficult to kill animals, birds, or anybody else, it's extremely cruel. What we're talking about is um, a mixture of gases, which is based on argon and or nitrogen, which is claimed by certain poultry welfare scientists to be the least inhumane method of killing the birds that anybody can imagine, okay? So, and I have become an endorser of this as far as I can discern from all the reading I've done. I, I am totally convinced, as Virgil said, I, I spent a decade reading about electrical, uh, uh, so-called stunning, which it isn't, as you said. And it's the most god-awful torture that you could possibly devise for anybody. So it couldn't be worse. Anything would be a step up from that. Even CO2, probably. <coughs> probably. But we're talking about just different methods, of, I mean, different procedures of just causing torture. But it seems that this gas mixture method, uh, they, for example, will a chicken and a pig walk into a CO2 chamber without showing any aversion? No. But back in the 50s, when they were trying to get the humane slaughter law passed, Oh, everybody, the animal people, the animal welfare groups at that time were touting 
CO2, as opposed to wheels and bludgeoning and ripping legs apart. It, it's, it appeared to be less inhumane than just these very crude uh, physical objects that were used to bang animals on the head and so forth. But now it's known that CO2 is not a, a, a humane death at all, but yet it's used widely, especially when you want to call whole flocks of thousands of birds because of the avian influenza or something. Anyway, so we're just so it's clear that we're talking about a type of gas mixture that uh, uh, that's supposed to be uh, the, the least inhumane method of, of rendering the birds unconscious, whereby they go into a chamber and it is asserted that they show no aversion. They will continue to eat. They will gradually pass out. That's what I've read, okay? But my question goes back to what Bruce asked. Um, when we talk about uh, gassing the birds in the transport crates. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, ma'am. What jobs would be eliminated that now, what would be the procedure? As far as no job would be eliminated by gas killing. First, they're, they're, let's say the birds are stunned killed in the crates, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody, people still have to grab them out of the crates, right? Are they Actually, they're dumped in, in a, with an automated machine, but yes, they would still have to be dumped out, hung on the line, and their throat would still have to be cut. You can't sell a bird with the uh, a chicken with the uh, blood still in it. Okay, so you had said earlier, and I know there's been a great deal of dispute about this in the poultry industry versus some of the poultry welfarists. The poultry industry insists you have to keep the birds heart beating so they'll bleed out faster, as you said. Yes, ma'am. There are others, um, these scientists, who will, some of them will claim that that's really a myth, that there might be a couple of extra seconds, but really uh, a dead bird and a live bird with the heart still beating bleed out in approximately the same t amount of time. And I don't know. The industry is relenting. They are relenting on this. They're relenting. They're just, you know, they're wrong. And the European scientists and even the European industry has now completely relented. So it's a little tough for Rick Lobb and then other okay. stuff suckers at NCC to keep saying that uh, when science everywhere else in the world is saying that's just not true. Okay, well, see, they've been saying that since the 70s. Some of these poultry scientists who have been doing these endless experiments, because these ex slaughter experiments are going on all the time, all over the world. So, okay, so, so you've got these, so you, you administer the gas, which I think would be very, dip, I'd see all this is very difficult to control the gas and the amount, and as you say, you know, the equipment has to be working right, and the person has to know what he's doing, and you know, just so many variables, but let's say, ideally, you, you stun kill the birds with this gas mixture in the crates, right? Right. So they're, they're dead. Yes, ma'am. Now, you're hanging them up on the shackles, right? Right. So then, and so somebody, are you saying a machine would grab them out and hang them on the shackles? No, ma'am. What happens is a forklift takes them from the truck and puts them on what's called a dump. It's an automated roller bed that draws the cages up to another part of that machine that has two big arms that stick out like this. The cage sits on it. The doors of the cage are either spring-loaded or they're drawers that slide out like a dresser door to a certain spot and then they stop. It dumps onto a belt. The hanger on the inside of the uh, the first hanger, what's called the lead hanger. He's got this button, or actually a lever, that sticks out like this from the belt. And you take your leg and you mash it like that, and it runs that belt up. The dump operator's job is to stand there and watch. When the belt in front of him runs empty, he dumps the next cage. So that would still be done the same way. You, there's, they, they don't try to take them out of the cages one at a time, at least they didn't at any plant I've worked at. They dump them like that. And then the lead hanger is responsible for running the chickens in and making sure that everybody has chickens. And of course, he still has to hang his shackles too. And there, would, there still would be throat cutting, right? Yes, ma'am. There was. They would still have to cut the throats. I guess my question is, what jobs would be eliminated that would cause workers to feel to, to be opposed to? Actually, a job would be added. Maybe a couple of jobs. The uh, person who ran the kill, the gas killer itself, the gas stunner, however you want to put it. That, that person, there would be a new job there. Of course, you would probably have to be technically trained or you'd kill a bunch of people, which would probably happen. Because Tyson just doesn't bother training his people that well. I'm terrible with names. I'm sorry. I'm terrible with names. If you tell me about 50 times, I'll remember it. Gas slaughter, is it wild gas cost? 
the cost, there would be an initial cost, but I think they would save money in the long run. The reason is, they don't want to give in to us. Because they're afraid if they give in on this issue, they're going to have to give in on another one and another one and another one, and they'll eventually cave in. They don't want to give in. They want to fight. Uh, well, just uh, was she a vegetarian or was she, did she work at a plan or, you know, just kind of what made her so... Uh, she grew up in Shreveport volunteering at animal shelters. She's just got a natural love for animals and a natural desire to act when she sees something wrong. And, of course, you know, I mean, she wanted to help me simply because we love each other. So, uh, and she had a career before she and I met, she moved to, before she moved to Arkansas and she and I met as an office worker, so she was familiar with computers. So that helped a lot too. Yes, ma'am. What keeps these uh, workers from being unionized? A lack of solidarity and the fact that if somebody gets found out as uh, speaking out, they get terminated quickly. They're eliminated quickly. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question for you, answer. Also, back in the 1980s, when, um, when Purdue workers uh, started to, uh, to to try and unionize, um, Frank Purdue went to um, the Gambini family uh -huh. up in New York and asked them uh, to intervene. Now, allegedly, according to his testimony to the President's Commission on Organized Crime, they told him no. Um, but interestingly enough, that organizing drive just suddenly stopped and nobody quite knows what happened to it. Um, well, that not but, 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 um, I just wanted to say, and, uh, and there's sort of a precursor to some of what I'll talk about tomorrow, but just since we've got Peter here and, and UPC here and you here, Virgil, I want your idea about this too. I just, you know, when we're talking about new jobs, let's not forget that the I that what we really need to do is bring economic diversification to these rural areas and the reorientation of agriculture in these rural areas. That's what we have to do to help the animals and the people and the environment. Now, we know it's possible to do it. In the tobacco growing areas of this very country, farmers have successfully transitioned from tobacco growing to, for example, organic vegetable growing. But it's the kind of thing that has to be campaigned for and has to be planned for in a really long-term way. And so while, of course, I support everything that we try to do that, that helps the animals and, and the workers in the interim, I just hope that we have, I don't never hear us talking about that long-term goal. And, and I just want to bring that up and ask you, Virgil, don't you think that's what we need in these rural areas, better education, more job possibilities? Yes. Definitely. I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, wouldn't it be better? I mean, you can make a chicken catcher's job incrementally better, but no chicken catcher wants to be a chicken catcher anyway. So the best thing you can do is offer him another, a different job. Uh, and I also, think that's something that people can get behind. Also, you would have influx of illegal immigrants because, you know, they're always going to use those if they can. Yeah, Jim. that's a really big key. Historically, the poultry industries had real difficulty in organizing because the six low-level jobs, really the only people that take those jobs are the ones that have to, they don't have any other choices. Another thing is in every one of these areas you move to, on purpose, they move to the most impoverished, ignorant, backward parts of the country, yes. knowing that they'll have a, you know, a, a labor pool that has no choices, no awareness, they, they're stuck. And uh, and they'll also, as they've done in some parts of the South, they'll move to areas where they can pit races against each other to keep them under control. I know there's quite a study on uh, some of the areas of North Carolina where they've got Native American populations, black populations, and hillbilly populations, and they're all in each other's throats over these jobs. Yes, and that's it. just a classic study in the way they manipulate people against each other. And another thing, poultry industry has done historically is move. Yeah. You started out in New England, the egg industry used to be Maine and New England states and, and the broiler capital was right here and when the, you know when the labor heat gets on they move to the south, they move to Mississippi. And when they get onto their case there they move to Arkansas. And they'll go to Mexico next. Yes, uh, Tyson's already moved to Mexico and China.
Yeah, those those processing plants are obsolete. What? Well, see, this raises a this to me in regard to what Patrice just said because she and I discussed this whole idea of you know finding helping helping uh, workers on the eastern shore to, to to want to do something to bring about a more diversified. Uh, type of uh, farming and crop, you know, crop growing, so that they would not have to work for Purdue or Tyson. But what concerns me about that is just relocating the business. Like, for example, Purdue has been complaining that they're going to move out of Maryland and the Eastern Shore if it becomes too expensive to do business there. They're going to be taxed. They're going to have to, and you know, uh, obey certain environmental laws and. And then the workers maybe are going to get higher pay. Well, then they can move offshore. They can go. They mm -hmm. can take their operations. They can raise their birds. They'll. They, they will make a decision. Okay. So now we have a more diversified eastern shore, right? There now there are more t potatoes and tomatoes and things being grown there, and uh, not everybody is forced to just go into the poultry industry. Okay. So now they move their stuff to Thailand or Bangkok or Mexico or someplace. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're not just. They're actually raising the birds in these places, and then just uh, you know bringing the bringing them back up into this country. So I don't see that as ultimately uh, helping the birds. No, uh, it's not. They're going to be moved to places where, if anything, if it's possible to even possibly imagine them being treated worse, where there's absolutely not even a concern for welfare, or it's never even been heard of for birds. Uh, I just see that as a serious problem. It's just this. Okay, you get rid of it here, but you relocate it over there. To me, that's one of the reasons why you know fighting to get people to not eat these birds, to not purchase these products, yes. is ultimately the only answer. Just like how are you going to get rid of the fur business? You get people to stop buying furs, and in the meantime, try to make the situation better, right? As better as possible for the birds, realizing it's not good, and yes. for the workers, maybe take a little of the rage out of them because they are not yes. being. It's so furious and miserable all the time that they're taking it out on the only ones they can take it out on the birds and maybe their families, right? Or yes. both. But I just this idea of just relocating with with the same number of birds being produced, the same procedures, except now it's being done offshore instead of in Delmarva or in northwest Arkansas or something. What what are your what's your response to that? I believe that the only thing we can do is like you said to either spread the word of, from the animal rights community or regulate it in some other way so that they can't export them back to this country unless they're done by our, our, our laws, which are going to have to be um, made better. That's about the only thing I can figure.